Hello and thanks for joining us for Talking Europe, France Franquette's regular look at what's hap really happening here in Brussels. Today's guest is Margaritas Skinas. Many thanks for joining us. Uh, after a career as a Greek MEP from the EPP Group, uh, as well as the Chief Spokesman for the European Commission, you've just taken up office this week uh, as the Vice President of the new European Commission uh, and Commissioner for Promoting the European Way of Life. Uh, your portfolio includes three main aspects, migration, frontier controls and security, and education and integration into the labour market of newcomers and immigrants uh, to Europe, as well as coordinating cooperation on anti-terrorism measures. Now, your commission, when it was first created earlier this year, did raise questions about its original name. Originally, it was the Commission for the Protection of European Values. Now, it's the promotion of those same European values. Uh, do you think the Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, had to cave in faced with some of the criticism? And do you see why it had to change? Well, uh, this is uh, European democracy. Um, the new commission uh, was uh, subjected to the uh, scrutiny of the European Parliament, and the European Parliament thought that the uh, term protection um, risks being understood as uh, protection against something that is a threat or an aggression. So they suggested uh, uh, the term promotion instead, which uh, it's uh, perfectly uh, understandable and uh, makes total sense. So I know there has been a bit of a drama around this change, but I'm perfectly, uh, personally, ha perfectly happy with it. OK, and it's got a very wide-ranging brief, it has to be said. What are the European values that, feel, that you feel need to be the most promoted? Look, look what Europe represents today in a very uh, uncertain world. We are democracies. We protect our minorities. The role of uh, women in society, fam in uh, family and in the workplace is safeguarded. We have... Uh, universal systems for education and healthcare. We are the world champions of human rights, uh, data protection. We have no pe death penalty. Bits and pieces of all this you can find everywhere too, uh, elsewhere too, but all this together you will only find in Europe. So my job would be to bring together these elements of a Europe that protects, a Europe that empowers, and make a case for what Europe represents today. OK, the past commission under Jean-Claude uh, Juncker had to overcome a number of pretty serious crises uh, here in Europe. Terrorism, uh, the migration uh, influx since 2015, Brexit. What are your hopes uh, moving forwards uh, about uh, the ability of the current commission to overcome similar kinds of crises and similar kinds of uh, situations? Uh, I don't want to sound too optimistic, but I think that uh, the era of crisis we're leaving behind. Uh, and uh, indeed, as you rightly point out, the Juncker Commission was uh, quite successful in dealing with what uh, Juncker called the poly-crisis. Uh, now, the new Commission, if, if one looks for an overall uh, objective, I would say uh, the new Commission will be the Commission that would have to implement the transition. Transition to a greener economy, transition to digital Europe, and also transition to a, a, a resilient uh, societies where we can bring uh, together different elements like the ones that are, fall under my brief to make sure that our societies for the future can cope uh, uh, with the pressures in terms of skills, unemployment, knowledge, uh, upskilling uh, that uh, are awaiting us. Okay. And one of the big priorities is, is, of course, overhauling Europe's migration and asylum policies. Uh, you've called it yourself one of the most uh, emblematic priorities of the incoming uh, Commission. It is at the heart of Europe's future, for good or for ill. How do you think you're going to be able to uh, achieve that objective and achieve it in coordination with all of the member states who have very different priorities? For example, the, the countries from Eastern Europe, such as Hungary, who are much less uh, 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 likely to want to uh, uh, welcome asylum seekers in, into the, those countries? I agree that it will not be easy, but it has to be done. Europe's asylum laws date back uh, from an era where the only ones uh, applying for asylum were those fleeing the dictatorships uh, from European uh, southern countries like Greece, uh, Spain. Now we have massive uh, movements of uh, asylum seekers and it's totally unfair for our frontline member states to assume a disproportional burden of processing these asylum uh, claims uh, on behalf of the rest. So uh, indeed this 
new EU pact for asylum and migration has to happen. It has to happen fast. And indeed, uh, I'm convinced that it has to happen in a situation that brings everybody together. I don't think that... Uh, um, a situation where some think that they are defeated in the overall negotiation, something that suits Europe. We have to bridge, uh, to build bridges and bring everyone uh, on board. We have to create the conditions, a package where everybody can find elements that are interesting for, for them. And we have to create a win-win situation that would allow Europe to modernize uh, its asylum laws. This is an opportunity and a priority. You say the pact needs to be achieved fast. What time frame do you have for that? I think uh, we have a, a European summit on the 25th, 26th of March and the Justice and Home Affairs uh, uh, Council of Ministers uh, 10 days before that. I think that uh, the pact has to be on the table before that, before these dates. Okay, you mentioned there the difficulties facing frontline states, such as Greece, from which you are, of course, a native. Uh, the new government in Greece uh, has announced uh, recently that it's closing down three uh, migrant camps on three islands. Uh, the, po the population of, uh, of migrants being able to be uh, lodged there will fall from 27,000 to 15,000. Is this a new hardline approach from the new government, the new right-wing government uh, in Athens? Uh, and uh, is it justified? No, uh, it is not a hardline approach. It's a different approach. Uh, as you know, the situation in, in the Greek islands has worsened significantly uh, as a result of the very irregular uh, flaws, migratory flaws from Turkey. And um, the decision to create uh, more centers, more reception facilities in mainland Greece to uh, take some of the burden out of the islands and spread it around the country, it's something that uh, goes uh, to the direction that uh, the European Commission have always uh, suggested. Uh, this leads to a more orderly management of, of migration in Greece and the speedier uh, uh, processing of asylum requests. But this is again an interim solution. The, 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 the definite solution would be the reform of EU asylum law. This is what makes sense not only for Greece but for all our member states. And one of the first stops for you uh, in your post as Commissioner and Vice President is both Greece and Turkey uh, to discuss uh, the response to the flow of migrants and refugees. Uh, this comes after the, 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 the President of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has threatened to reopen, quote, the gates uh, to Europe if Turkey doesn't receive further funding. That's on top of the €6 billion Euros that's already been, pay, been paid by the EU since the 2016 deal, which kind of put an end to the, the open uh, flow towards Europe uh, from Turkey. Turkey. Uh, what is your message uh, going to be to Turkey in the face of that kind of threat? I think that we have to uh, put aside uh, the rhetoric and concentrate on the substance. Uh, we do have uh, an EU-Turkey agreement for an orderly management of migratory flows. Um, uh, the problem with this agreement is that it's being applied uh, in a way that I could call irregular. So sometimes you have many people crossing, sometimes you have non-crossing. Non so we need a more predictable, orderly management as stipulated in the agreement. And of course, we need to continue engaging with Turkey uh, because we should never forget that Turkey already uh, uh, has 4 million Syrian refugees on their territory uh, and they have to uh, continue uh, organizing the reception facilities for these people with the help of the European Union. So when a neighbor has a problem, you have to engage with a neighbor. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's not very productive that we concentrate on rhetoric, statements and so forth, so on and so forth. Okay. And one of the other principal uh, routes into Europe uh, for the migrants and refugees, uh, on top of the Turkey uh, route, is the route from Libya. Uh, since uh, 2016, the EU has poured 300 million euros into, into, into Libya on the basis of the, the, the control of the flow of migrants will be controlled on the Libyan side. The result has seen uh, the, the arrivals in Europe falling from 100,000 in 2017 to uh, barely 1,000 by August of this year. So on that side, it does seem to be a success. But can it be judged a success when uh, that money is being handed to uh, a government which is uh, finding it difficult to run its own own affairs and amongst uh, allegations of corruption uh, uh, in the retention centres? No one is uh, happy or proud with the situation that exists in Libya. Libya is a state which is in the chaos of a civil war. There is no reliable interlocutor. So the um, uh, 
situation in the camps is uh, far from uh, satisfactory. It's, it's dramatic, it's unacceptable, but it is not the European Union that it manages uh, uh, these camps. It's the authorities there, of whatever is left of the, of the government authorities. Uh, luckily, the UN agencies uh, are there trying to help as much as they can with the EU support. But I agree with you that uh, the situation in Libya is, is, is becoming now dramatic, not to say intolerant. But the EU recently renewed its deal with the Libyan authorities, and this comes almost at the same time as a recently leaked EU report outlining human rights violations, deaths, disappearances and corruption uh, are rife within the Libyan uh, uh, detention centres. How can we justify those two positions? We have to change uh, the, the conditions there, but the deal is being renewed. I'm not sure that uh, I understand what this deal refers to. I think that you refer to the uh, situation where the Italian uh, Coast Guard uh, uh, cooperates with uh, Libyan authorities in organizing uh, uh, sea uh, rescue operations. You should not the forget I mean, uh, the, Libyan, the, the Libyan funding. territories, the Libyan uh, sea zone is uh, 200 miles. It's a vast uh, area in which Europeans cannot go there. It's for the Libyans to, to, to organize their operations. So I think that uh, it, is, it is not fair to blame the European Union for a situation that is much more uh, complex and much more uh, complicated because of the ongoing chaos of the Libyan civil war. Well then just to return to that, uh, that previous point that you made, that uh, the situation is unsatisfactory, does that mean there is a, a scope for uh, changing the conditions on which uh, EU aid is uh, passed to the, uh, to the Libyan authorities uh, if they cannot improve the situation in the, the detention centres themselves that they run? The EU uh, approach is to help the UN agencies that are on the ground to help the Libyan authorities or whatever is left of them to organise uh, the situation uh, as best as we can. We also have helped the UN, agents, uh, UN agencies, UNHCR, to organise uh, legal pathways that would take uh, some of these uh, people out of their difficult situations. But I repeat, we cannot, Europe cannot uh, substitute uh, the Libyan authorities or whatever is left of the Libyan authorities in a situation which is uh, totally, totally unsatisfactory. Okay. The, the EU helped uh, Libya create its uh, search and rescue zone off its coast, as you mentioned there, that extends far into the Mediterranean. No, I didn't say that with all due respect. Okay. I, 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 you, you, you insist in using terms that I haven't said. I said that the Italian uh, Coast Guard, no. the Italian authorities have been working with the Libyan counterparts to organize search and rescue operate, to help them organize search and rescue operators within the Libyan uh, search and rescue area. But is it fair for the people that have been rescued to be sent back to uh, a situation which is either uh, a war zone or close to a war zone or is in a state of chaos? I'm not sure what you are referring about. The, the situation in the Libyan search and rescue area is not in the hands of anybody else but the Libyans. As you mentioned, there are different member states have uh, the complete sovereignty to deal with uh, the, uh, the Libyan situation. Uh, France this week decided not to, not to send six boats to Libya. This is under following pressure from humanitarian uh, NGOs uh, uh, that were supposed to help the uh, Libyan coast guards. Does that give the impression that Paris is perhaps breaking away from uh, the European uh, uh, uniformity on this response and saying uh, Libya is no longer a reliable partner? I have just uh, assumed the uh, duties of coordinating a vice president and I'm not sure that I'm aware of all bilateral uh, uh, opportunities or engagements or initiatives, so I wouldn't like to offer an opinion on something that I'm not aware of, I'm okay. sorry. Returning then to, to your broader portfolio, the, the, the key... Uh as has been pointed out, is that migration and dealing with the, the, the consequences of migration is really much essential for the credibility of the EU. Uh, go, moving forwards, how can things change uh, from the situation from 2015 to now has improved dramatically uh, from the European perspective? Is it possible that that can continue uh, those uh, changes under your uh, mandate? Look, migration is one uh, part of my uh, broader brief. Uh, migration... Uh, uh, the management, the, the essence of European migration policy is very simple. Europe will continue to be an asylum destination. Everyone who needs protection has this, must have the certainty that uh, we'll find it in Europe. This is what defines us. This is who we are. At the same time, uh, it has to be said very clearly that those that are not eligible for protection under asylum laws and they have no reason to be uh, in Europe, they would have to be uh, 
returned, going back to their countries, through returns that are uh, humane, organized, properly funded by the European Union. That's how this is the overarching uh, objective of uh, migration policy. At the same time, we have to take uh, to make sure that these new Europeans that are legally with us uh, have access to all sorts of services that are necessary to allow them to integrate into our societies, education, health, uh, skills, uh, mobility. Uh, this is something that is also part of what we need to do. And at the same time, we have to work on the side of education, culture, youth, sport, public health, and make sure that we harvest from all these policy areas added value that can uh, make Europe a better place to live, leaving nobody behind. Margarita Skinas, Vice President of the EU Commission, many thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, speak with us. Uh, more Talking Europe after this short break. Lebanon's Tel Abbas refugee camp, over 50 Syrian families live in makeshift shelters. They have fled war and escaped massacres. Bashar al-Assad's government is calling Syrians home, but the international community is opposed to it. Reports are rampant of random arrests and torture allegedly being carried out by the Syrian government. Though protected under international law, Syria's refugees are no longer welcome in a number of their host countries. In Lebanon, for example, soldiers tear down refugee camps and curfews are imposed. Syrian refugees are caught between al-Assad's government and wary host countries. Don't miss this exclusive web documentary investigation on France24.com.